What is God's goal for for our church? What's his vision, his purpose, uh, not only for our church, but for all churches, every church in Gympie, but every church around the world? What's God's goal? Uh, what's your goal or vision for our church? Uh, and how close do these two things match? At the end of 2 Thessalonians, we hear God's goal for his church. God's goal is for peace and grace to continue within his people. So have a look at verse 16, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The goal for church is that we would experience the presence of Jesus, his presence in peace and grace. In the context of this letter, it's both grace from God and the peace we now have with him through the cross of Jesus, sins forgiven, enemies reconciled. But it's also a community where we have peace with one another and we grow in grace-filled and grace-shaped lives. Grace and peace starts this letter, chapter 1, verse 2. The letter starts and it ends with peace and grace because that's God's goal for this brand new church in Thessalonica. And it's God's goal for our church as well. And we've seen this all the way through 2 Thessalonians. Uh, This is our final week in 2 Thessalonians, so a quick overview of where we've been in this letter. What has God said to the church in Thessalonica and also to our church through the Apostle Paul. God's encouraged them to stand firm under pressure. He's given thanks that God has preserved them through persecution. Encouraged them by knowing that God's judgment is coming on those who persecute and also he's given thanks for the growing love of this baby church. This is a community shaped by peace, grace and love It's shaped by this despite persecution and despite false teaching. Remember, we had the the false teaching, the anxiety-inducing false teaching about the day of the Lord. And Paul dealt with the false teaching by giving them the truth, the truth of right expectations. Churches will experience both groaning and growth, suffering and struggle until Jesus returns. And where there's been false teaching, Paul has corrected them with truth. Where there's struggle, churches are encouraged to lift their eyes to the Lord Jesus. But what about disruption? Church is the means God uses to form us to be more like Jesus. Church is how God makes people, Christian people, grow in peace and grace. But we all know this isn't always the case. How does a church deal with disruption, with people who are disruptive, who are destructive to the goal of peace and grace in God's church, who aren't on board with growing as disciples of Jesus. That's the final problem this letter deals with. So the problem that's taken hold in Thessalonica is some of the church members are idle and disruptive. So have a look at verse 6. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, this is a serious message to end the letter, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. And then look down at verse 11. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. So we give it a bit of a picture about what's going on, but we're not told exactly what's going on. Some people think the problem is an outworking of the false teaching. Some people think Jesus has already returned, the day of the Lord has already come, and so they stop working. Uh, This kind of thing happens with false teaching around the return of Jesus. If you've been told Judgment Day is coming, May 21, 2011, that's what Harold Camping told his followers, if that's what you thought was going to happen, then you're not going to pay your power bill if it's due on May 22. You're not going to plant crops for next year because you believe, well, by then we're going to be living in the new creation. And you'd quit your job waiting for the world to end. That could be what's going on in Thessalonica, though it doesn't actually say that's the reason. It could simply be laziness. 
people presuming upon the generosity of fellow church members. Ha, huh, why shouldn't I just play computer games all day, sit on my deck, enjoying chatting with the neighbours and interrupting their hard work? Because, well, Fred and Julie in our church, they're super rich, and Jesus commands them to be generous to give to the needy, so they'll put food on my table. It could be some church members are presuming on the generosity of others. Though, that doesn't explain why they're called disruptive. If you're lazy, you're not necessarily a busybody. In fact, you're not much of a busy anything. So another idea, and I think it could be something along these lines, uh, the disruptive people had assumed some kind of authority and leadership within the church. Uh, You notice there's no mention of elders or deacons in this letter. I think the church was so young, God hasn't raised any up yet. None have been appointed, but maybe some in the community have taken this role upon themselves. And in doing this, they're inserting themselves into other people's lives. They're being busybodies and they're expecting to be financially supported whilst they do that. And we'll get to why that is in a moment. I think this fits the picture of the letter a bit better. It also explains why in verse 6, Paul tells the people to keep away from these people. They're not just lazy, they're ungodly, fake leaders. They disrupt the peace and grace God desires for his church. And that's why Paul makes his own ministry, the way he went about as an apostle of the Lord Jesus, he makes his own ministry an example. He's not just an example of Christian discipleship in general, but an example of hard-working, self-giving leadership. So verse 7, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle while we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Now, verse 9 is significant. It would have been right for Paul and the team with him, Paul, Timothy and Silas, as gospel workers, as evangelists and leaders of Christ church, it would have been right for them to receive financial support from the believers in Thessalonica, but they didn't. It seems they didn't receive financial support because they could sense a potential problem. Maybe there was something in Thessalonian culture Maybe they noticed something in the character of some of the believers. Maybe they could tell the wrong type of people would become leaders to get financial support and to become busybodies. And so they set an example of working with their hands and not burdening this baby church. Now, there's a bit more to the story than this. We know from the letter to the Philippian church, Paul, Timothy and Silas received financial support from Philippi whilst they were in Thessalonica. In in Philippians 4 it says, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. This is a normal part of life in Christ. Churches partner together in the work of the gospel. It's normal for leaders and preachers to receive financial partnership. As Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians, in the same way the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. That's the normal Christian practice. But maybe for cultural reasons, maybe due to certain personalities... Paul did not receive any financial support from the Thessalonian church in these early days. The mission team laboured day and night. The Philippians also sent some money down to help them out. And so the mission team were not an example of being disruptive. In fact, they were the opposite. They weren't busybodies. They were busy proclaiming Christ and working with their hands. Their lives are examples of what kind of people we need, what kind of men we need in Christian leadership they're also an example of Christian discipleship, of living living out the peace and grace we have in the Lord Jesus. Now, that's the particularities. I think, though, we want to take this as our main point. This is the bit we need to hear. How does God work to change people, uh, to form, pe- form believers into the likeness of Jesus? 
Paul just could have said, oi, this is how we live. No, but he doesn't do that. He says, look at my example. God changes us by providing examples, people to imitate. What is God's goal for the church? Church is the community where discipleship happens. And a significant way it happens is through examples. Church is a place where older believers, men and women who've walked with Jesus for many years, they provide an example for us who are younger in the faith. It feels like I'm banging this drum a lot at the moment, but in our current context, we need to hear this. If you get on YouTube, there's lots of rubbish, but you can also listen to heaps of preachers that are much better than me. If you get onto Spotify, you can listen to your favourite hymns and songs of praise sung by some of the most talented singers and choirs. If what you're looking for in church is a lecture and a concert, you're better off sitting at home watching your phone. But if God's goal in the church is transformed lives, if it's living and continuing in the peace and grace of Christ, you cannot get that from the internet. God uses lived examples of godliness to shape and form us. Men and women older in the faith, showing us how to keep taking the next step with Jesus. Men and women younger in the faith, reminding us of the joy and passion that comes when you have that first experience of the freedom that forgiveness of sin brings. Brothers and sisters, we need the church. I need church. Because one of the ways God changes us and grows us in Christian maturity is through the examples of one another. God also uh, changes us through teaching. That's why we gather to hear God's word, through hearing what we need to hear when we need to hear it. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Uh, Very briefly, the content of Paul's teaching, verse 10, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. The word unwilling is very important in this sentence. Uh, Those who love money love to twist this rule. They love to misquote this verse. They'll say, if you don't work you don't eat. But that's not what it says, is it? It's about those who are unwilling. Uh, This rule doesn't contradict everything else the Bible says about caring for the poor. Acts chapter 6, the church in Jerusalem put food on the table for loads of widows. It was a big job. It took at least seven people to administer the daily food distribution. Those widows couldn't work, but they did eat. The Bible doesn't teach if you don't work, you don't eat. No, the Bible teaches generous love of neighbour. Christians are commanded, Romans 12, 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Hospitality is not throwing dinner parties, it's loving strangers, generously caring for those in need. And Paul's rule that he taught in Thessalonica, if you're not willing to work, you won't eat, doesn't contradict this in the slightest. So hear this clearly. If you're unable to work and put food on the table and a roof over your head, if you're unable to do that due to ill health, physical or mental health, or if you can't work due to age or frailty, this rule is not talking about you. It's about those who are unwilling. If you'd love to work but you can't even get an interview, you can't get a job or you can't get enough shifts, this rule is not talking about you. Romans 12, 13, the church is called to share with those in need. And isn't it lovely also that not just the church but our community as a whole does this through various government arranged programs. But it's also a first call upon us as God's church. Unemployment and health issues aren't what's going on in Thessalonica. The problem is idle and disruptive people. This passage is about the character of the church, growing as a church into the likeness of Christ, being more and more like Jesus. And so then, what do we do as a church with those whose behaviour is disruptive and destructive to the people of God? They're unwilling unwilling to do anything useful. They're just being busybodies. They're unwilling to participate in the life of the church family. They're They're able to do it, but they won't. Well then, 
the church must not enable disruptive and destructive behaviour. God's concerned with forming and growing disciples. This passage is about the character of the church, about being a community where people care and contribute rather than being disruptive. So then what do you do then as a church when someone won't listen to the Bible's teaching? What do we do if someone doesn't follow the example set by more mature Christians in the church? How do we respond to disruptive people? Well, Paul says there's firm action the church must take with disruptive people, those, be- those whose behaviour is destructive to spiritual formation. Uh, we heard it already at the start of the section. Verse 6 says, keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. And th- this part of the letter finishes by expanding on what this means. Verse 14, take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet, do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. As we read these verses, I reckon some of us are a little bit anxious. Maybe we're anxious because we've seen a church where discipline has been harsh, which has been destructive, not redemptive, where it's been unjust, even abusive. Or maybe you've been disappointed or hurt because elders have been reluctant to call people to account. Disruptive and destructive behaviour has been allowed to go unchecked and that's caused enormous damage. We need to acknowledge our experience as we hear what God says. And what God says, there's a bit of tension, did you notice in this passage? On one hand, we're told, keep away from certain people. Don't associate with them. On the other hand, they're a fellow believer. Don't treat them as an enemy. On one hand, it sounds like cancelling them. But on the other hand, they're still part of God's family. So how do we actually live this out? Uh, When we hear the term church discipline, sometimes What comes to our brain straight away is the word excommunication, which means removing someone from communicant membership with the church, often excluding them from sharing in the Lord's Supper. In some cases, that means the person is no longer welcome to walk in the door. But if Paul says treat them as a fellow believer, he's not at that stage yet. He's not talking about that level of church discipline. There are plenty of graduations to deal with different situations. Uh, Church discipline may result in removing someone from a position of leadership in a church or from serving in certain areas. It can involve removing them from membership. None of these actions are done lightly. It's always to deal with consistent, unrepentant behaviour, unwillingness to grow more like Jesus. And just something to note, I think one of the the great strengths of Presbyterianism and other denominations that have strong connections, there's a way to appeal disciplinary decisions a group of elders, a church session takes. There is accountability for the leadership if they're doing things that aren't being done for the good of the church and the glory of Jesus. Uh, Discipline could mean putting boundaries in place. Maybe a person is welcome to gather with God's people on Sunday. Maybe there'll be certain conditions around that, but they're not welcome to be part of a growth group or or vice versa. It really depends on the situation, doesn't it, and the various circumstances. But most important is the goal. Uh, Do you see the goal there at the end of verse 14? The goal is the person may feel ashamed. Uh, We need to be careful with the word ashamed. This isn't never show your face again shame. Uh, Shame is often used to communicate that you're not worth anything as a person, you are worthless. But that can't be what's going on here because the person, even though they've been a disruptive busybody, we're to treat them as a fellow believer. The shame Paul wants them to experience is we love you, but... This behaviour doesn't fit the kind of people Jesus is forming us to be. I recently came across this kind of idea in a book by Michael Hendricks. He talks about healthy correction or healthy shame, where we love each other enough in the church 
to have a conversation, to say, I love you, we love you, you're a precious part of God's family, but when you spoke about Lucy behind her back, that is not who we are as God's family. We don't slander, we don't gossip. Or when you grumbled about the piano being out of time, as we sang, or grumbled about the morning tea not being up to your standards, that's not who we are as God's family. We don't grumble. We encourage, we contribute and help. Now, there is a sense of shame when someone calls out disruptive behaviour. But when it's said in love, and the invitation is to grow, it can be healthy. The goal of church discipline is always growth in Christ and restoration. Uh, The growth of the person who's been disruptive, they're a fellow believer, they are not the enemy. And it's also for the good of the whole church. Uh, Because God's goal for the church is that we grow in peace and grace through experiencing the presence of the Lord Jesus together. We see there at the end of the letter, is that your goal for our church? Is that what you want for yourself and for us together? Changed lives through knowing the peace and grace of the Lord Jesus. Let's be praying God is doing this and growing us in this. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you are working in us to change us, to make us more like Jesus, to grow us in the peace and grace that comes from the presence of Jesus. We acknowledge we fall short of your glory. At times we have been idle and disruptive. By our immaturity, we've worked against what you're doing in the church. And you've done, we've done that in ways that have been directly disruptive, but also in our passivity, being unwilling to have the hard conversations with brothers and sisters. Please grow us in repentance, true repentance. Give us godly examples to imitate. Make us into godly examples worthy of imitation. We ask you would make us a church community where by the Spirit, together we are growing more like Jesus. May we know peace and grace from his Spirit. For his glory we ask. Amen.